Hello and welcome everyone to the final session of the day today. I know it's been a long day and there have been some very heavy <laughs> and weighty conversations over the course of the day, but we appreciate you sticking with us to the end. And we will only hold you for 37 minutes now before we, before we get to drinks. But we're also talking about an important topic today. This session is named Dark Arts Governing the Creative Recovery. The art sector is a crucial contributor to the Australian economy. It employs 200,000 Australians directly and contributes $15 billion a year to the economy. But of course, you can't capture the importance of the arts in numbers alone. The arts nourish us, they're a source of inspiration. Sometimes they are a distraction from the grave events we've been talking about today. Sometimes, though, they help us understand those events in a deeper way that maybe the news pages and social media doesn't. During the pandemic, we all know the arts suffered greatly. Music halls went quiet, theatres shut their doors, and galleries were forced to close. With society reopening now and face-to-face -face gatherings like this thankfully with us again, it's time to ask what the recovery looks like for the art sector. And we're lucky today to have three eminent directors from some of Australia's most significant arts companies. And appropriately enough, even though I'm from Sydney, I'm told that Melbourne is the arts and cultural capital of Australia. So it's great we're doing it here, but of course we're also beaming this throughout Australia online as well. So hello to all of our virtual delegates uh, watching this session online. So our speakers today, we have to immediately to the left of me, Penny Fowler, GAICD. She's the chair of the National Portrait Gallery, the director of the Australian Ballet, deputy chairman of a very different type of cultural organisation, the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria. She's also the chairman of the Herald and Weekly Times, a board member of Tourism Australia and on the advisory board of Vizzy and the Bank of Melbourne. Sophie Gallis, GAICD, is the managing director of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and the chair of Symphony Services Australia. Sophie joined the MSO as its first female managing director in April 2016. Prior to that appointment, she was the chief executive officer of the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. Her previous roles also included executive director of the Quebec Symphony Orchestra, and we've had quite a few great Canadian speakers today, and Sophie is another one of those. <laughs> and she's also the executive and artistic, and she was also the executive and artistic director of the Oxford Arts Centre and music coordinator for the Quebec Arts Council. And then Jane, who is on my far left, but the audience is right. She is an active director in the not-for-profit sector and also has more than 25 years investment banking and management, ex management experience in London, New York and Australia. She's the chair of the Melbourne Theatre Company, director of Opera Australia, deputy chancellor of the University of Melbourne and chair and CEO of the Janssen Little Foundation. So thank you to all of you for joining us today. So the first question today is just about the last two years. As I said, it's been a challenge. It's been very difficult for arts organisations even to survive during this period. Can you all just talk us through that challenge of stewarding an arts organisation at this difficult time? How you and the organisation stayed re resilient and, and what you learnt through that period? I'll go to, go to you first, Penny. Okay, thanks, Ivan. Um, well, possibly, if I talk in the context of the ballet, it would be um, particularly in Melbourne. And the ballet, I mean, we're a performing arts organisation that couldn't perform our art. So you can imagine, um, as a board and as an organisation, trying to work out what do you do, firstly, to keep all your people safe? How do you um, ensure that you have financial um, sustainability going forward? And, um, and you're doing that from your living room and for your homes. And how do you change that organisation? So it was a really challenging time for the ballet. And we had to do things like, you know, cancel seasons. And you had to make those decisions early on as an organisation. I think, um, and luckily we've just now come out of that and we can actually perform again. But essentially the ballet hasn't performed in Melbourne for two years, which is our main market. We're a Melbourne-based company. So it's been very challenging. And um, I think you know, that key relationship between the board and the management, we had more, more board meetings, um, you know, we had court board calls, um, lots of decisions to make, quick decision making, really strong chair um, uh, of the ballet and great management. And so I think it, it was just a really challenging time for the ballet as an organisation. But I just think you sit there and you think to yourself, OK, how do we adapt and move forward in those changing times? With the portrait gallery, um, I just have taken over as the chair. We have a very strong chair there as well. So we've been really... The organisation I sit on in the arts are very fortunate, I think, to have people like that around the board table. Slightly different because we weren't 
closed. We're a government authority, a statutory authority too. So, um, uh, whereas the ballet is an independent organisation, not for profit. So, um, we uh, didn't have, we have more government funding, more reliance on government funding the portrait gallery. And so it was the same thing though, you know, you were still closed, you couldn't have your doors open. Um, I think one of the real challenges was looking after your teams and your staff and how did you help them through that time to make sure the organisation um, could continue on. Sophie? Well, the uh, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra found itself in uh, the city that was <laughs> that had the longest lockdown. Um, we are, in normal time, an organisation that is artistically and financially stable and actually uh, quite successful. And we suddenly found ourselves, our business model was based on earn revenues and we lost 80% of our <laughs> earn revenues. So facing um, with small reserves, uh, facing insolvency quite quickly, so big decisions for the board. Um, fortunately, uh, we were all um, aligned with a vision that an orchestra is nothing without its people and we needed to keep everyone employed. So it, it meant lots of sacrifices. And um, once that was um, underway, the second big challenges, challenge that we had was actually that our musician, it's an, we are in an organization that employs 400 people and 300 are musicians, <laughs> permanent and casuals, were suddenly uh, unable to perform their music with their colleagues in front of a live audience. So there was a huge sense of loss of purpose and um, major well-being challenges, mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. So we have increased communication um, of, and we've learned as we went along how to reach out, really work with the board, with management, with the teams, um, board meeting every two, three weeks, um, <laughs> then uh, company meeting every week, uh, emails every week, uh, creating small groups and focusing on talking about music. Then at some point we went into uh, training for mental health first aid because we, we saw our people really, really suffer mm -hmm. as we went through one lockdown after another. <laughs> and by now, uh, 22 of the top leadership of the orchestra, musician and staff have been trained and, and we're so happy we're back on stage. <laughs> We have opened last week with our season opening gala with a new chief conductor. So we've used the time to actually take care of our people, ensure that we would survive, but also keep the music going. So we pivoted to digital, created a digital platform, and used the time to think about the future and how to reinvent the orchestra. And um, yeah, with, with a new chief conductor and lots of projects in front of us, I think we're... There's a wind of uh, optimism at the MSO now. Yeah, those innovations during the pandemic to bring arts and culture online were really important. We'll, we'll get back to talking about them in a second. But before that, Jane, do you want to talk about your experiences on Opera Australia and the Melbourne Theatre Company boards? Cert <coughs> certainly. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I have just had a rat test because I have <laughs> my voice is going, but it's, I'm perfectly fine. Um, I will talk more about the MTC, uh, Melbourne Theatre Company, because that was uh, in, based in Melbourne, of course, so it was impacted more over the course of the two years, um, more than any other theatre company in the country, actually. Um, so in 2020, we cancelled 11 out of 12 shows, um, but the problem with trying to do that, it wasn't, it wasn't a decision made all at once, because if you recall... Um, you know, we were having sort of rolling lockdowns and it was very new and nobody really knew what was happening. So um, the sort of financial analysis and the business cases that we kept reviewing month after month after month, you know, trigger dates and if we open now, what are our loss, what are our sunk costs and, um, you know, where are our creatives located and can we get them back, can we get them into Victoria and, and this this is myriad of decisions that were sort of flowing down in a decision tree analysis, which kind of went through the whole year. So, um, you know, we always thought we were coming back, and and as you would appreciate, there's a lot of planning ahead of time in any creative endeavour. So, uh, hiring creatives and and booking them for a period could be 12 months ahead. 
So when you cancel that and what kind of losses you take, um, you know, it was very much, um, you know, I can say in hindsight now probably fascinating and I think we all learnt an enormous amount about managing for risk and compliance rather than growth and strategy, which is typically what a board thinks about. So <clears throat> it was really very much about mitigating risk um, and, and mitigating losses. And so over the course of the two years, we lost $20 million in revenue, um, millions of dollars in operating profits, um, losses of subscriber base went from, we had the largest subscriber base in, in, in Australia of around 21,000, which really underpinned the business for a very long time. Clearly that was vastly impacted, so that went down to, we're trying to rebuild it now at maybe 14, 15,000. Um, there's enormous loyalty to the Melbourne Theatre Company, um, thankfully. But, uh, you know, the audiences are clearly were very impacted and everybody was very nervous and, and I would say that is still continuing. So in 2020, what we mostly did was focus on reducing costs. So all the staff were stood... Uh, staff, a lot of the production staff were stood down. Everyone else worked for 0.8 of the period of time. Senior execs took really very large salary cuts. So there was an enormous... Um, co sort of a, a coherence in within the organisation that we're all in this together, everybody's going to suffer, we're all going to take some pain, everybody's going to have to use up their leave liabilities, all of those sorts of issues. So it was really all about managing costs in the first year, which we did very well, um, you know, as much, much as possible. Um, and then the, the, the planning cycle in a theatre company, similar, I'm sure, to Ballet, um, is at least a year ahead. So in the middle of 2020, we had to plan for 21. And if you remember, nobody really knew what it was going to look like. And there was a real feeling that 21 was going to be a recovery year. And so uh, fortunately, I was less sure about that. And so, you know, I, I said, we really need to be very, very careful with our costs and our and take a very conservative approach to coming back to stage. So what we did was split the season in two in, 20, in 2021, um, and the first six months was really just all about re-engaging and making people feel comfortable to be in public spaces and all of those sorts of things, with smaller events, sometimes outside, whatever it took to kind of keep people interested in theatre. And then the second half of the year, we had only six plays, whereas normally we would have 11 or 12. So a very short season with major implications for subscription sales and, and ticket sales, obviously. Um, so we, we started with six plays and, you know, that was in the middle of 2021 when everything fell apart again. So we started just with one show that was then closed um, and they were all very... Um, what we would describe as low production values, so simple plays, um, few, only a few actors on stage, not a lot, not elaborate sets, lower production values than people normally associate with their state theatre company, which is meant to be a sort of at the highest level and the most well-funded and all of that. So we had to kind of sort of downscale people's expectations, but also on the understanding that we were, had to be terribly careful of costs. So, as it turned out, if you will recall, of course, everything got shut down and so we ended up shutting the first show, cancelling the rest of the shows and then we put on what was going to be the one big show, a Simon Phillips show called As You Like It, one of Shakespeare's comedies that typically has been very successful and very popular and our loyal audiences expect to see. So, that was at the end of 2021 and that was meant to be the sort of blockbuster I think there were 11 people on stage, it was a lot of music, it was, uh, you know, much, much more expensive to stage. Because at the time, a year, a, over a year before, we thought by December we'd be reasonably safe. Of course, then Omicron hit, and so we just scraped through on getting most of those performances um, on stage, but uh, of course numbers dropped away terribly. So... Um, you know, the, the business planning cycle and all of those sorts of things have been very demanding, but, um, you know, there's been some real lessons learned, I think, and at the board level, just about how careful you have to be and how sort of strategic you have to be. And I think that is that will be a permanent change. I think boards will always start to think about that in the arts because 
you know, we all we all survived so narrow, narrowly, and we used up all our reserves, um, like I'm sure most other companies did. Uh, so coming into the pandemic, we were in a reasonably healthy situation because we'd always programmed things with a commercial lens somewhat, balancing that artistic endeavour and the desire for new works and Australian shows with the commercial imperative. Um, and now we're sort of, you know, coming into 2022. We've had two shows on stage. Again, um, wonderfully wonderful reviews, but the attendance has dropped away to sort of 40 to 50 percent because of Omicron. And um, our next show, which is just about to come on, um, the numbers are looking much, much better. So that's encouraging. And um, and with Opera Australia, the same, very similar thing. So. Um, the, t the trend is that people buy tickets much later, much closer to the date, which makes sense. Let, you know, more certainty, more certainty you're going to be well and that you're going to feel safe and that, you know, it'll be okay to come. So um, a lot shorter lead times, which makes it hard for planning and hard for budgeting. But um, that's sort of happened throughout the whole of the arts industry. And with Opera Australia, they also clearly were you know, devastated by the start of 2022 in Sydney. Um, they're, they're now just about to start with the opera on the harbour and fortunately that um, the sales are running, you know, at capacity on that. So I think there's a, there's a much more positive view out, out in, the, um, in the general community that it's OK to be out again as evidenced by today, really. Okay. Um, it is great to hear that and hear the type of optimism that you were talking about as well, mm. Sophie. And it's great to, you know, as you say, be here face to face today, and that we're going back to theatres, back to, back to concert halls. But just before talking about that face to face experience, we we have a question here about the virtual experience as well, and I'm sure you all do want to talk about that that experiment um, during the the pandemic to bring in new audiences, to put performances online, to um, to keep that connection alive with them. I know that you did that at the National um, Portrait Gallery, um, Penny. So, uh, just a couple of questions for that. Like, do, do you think that's successful and do you think it's here to stay? And then we have a question from Ruth about how you monetized those experiences. Like, how, how you actually brought some... Did you, were you able to bring some money in the door through, through putting those experiences online? So, I'll go to you first, Penny. Okay, sure. Well, I think it's really interesting, obviously, that experience um, has changed. Um, for instance, we, you know, we just opened the ballet to a sold-out in-person audience on Friday night for Anna Karenia. And next Monday, we'll do a streaming um, performance. So, you know, we wouldn't have done that before. It's a really great question. We also did some um, live streams during COVID. And we did, you know, the tickets were a lot less. They were like $20 a ticket. Um, it still cost a lot of money to put it on. So whilst they weren't going to be monetising us to the fact, you know, to enough, um, it's still ways of engaging our audiences. And I think that's one of the key things is how do we re-engage all those audiences? Um, and that virtual, uh, virtual and online presence, like here today, you've got a hybrid event. Um, so I think in at the Portrait Gallery, you know, we've done a lot... Um, we did a, an opening of uh, National Photographic Portrait Prize, an online opening. Um, we have virtual public programs. We have art classes online. And going forward, I think, you know, and, a lot, and we had a lot more engagement online um, at the Portrait Gallery. You know, we've got 50% more subscribers to our emails. We've got, you know, social media and uh, video views have gone up over 100%. And so I think all those, I mean, you, you've got to, I think your whole strategy as an arts company going forward has to include that online and virtual offering. And, and with the ballet, we have a YouTube channel. And um, I was asking someone, in the last 90 days, we've had 115,000 views of some of our content from Body Talk. And so these are all ways, and I think not only they are re-engaging our existing audiences, but I think going forward, they're going to be engaging new audiences too. I think you probably need a TikTok. Yeah, channel at this maybe, point, Penny. Yeah. Dance, dance is huge <laughs> on, on TikTok. Um, Sophie, did you want to talk about the, the online performances? Yeah, yeah. In our case, we had a digital strategy. Uh, we went to the board in 2019 with it, and we were thinking in three, four years' time we will be at this point, and then the pandemic hit, and uh, we fast forwarded everything. The first phase was to engage on YouTube with an audience around the world and we were lucky. Um, we came <laughs> 
uh, online at the time where all uh, venues were closing down around the world. So we uh, garnered a couple of millions of audience online in the first few months. We started experimenting, re offering, um, well, if people enjoyed it, to uh, make a donation. So we started receiving donations from 15 countries, which was a good source of income at that point. We were fundraising like mad, I would say. And then we introduced, we built a digital platform, so it's a behind a paywall, subscription and ticket and pay-per-view model. Uh, and now we have implemented a model where you can buy um, tickets to come to the concert hall and add uh, a subscription online. And we have kept that audience that we have um, found on YouTube ac actually to become members and we have now subscribers in 67 countries. So it was a really good experience and we find that actually um, people around Australia or around the world will come and, and actually watch concerts online because we, they're not streamed there on the platform. So, and um, yeah, it's been an interesting uh, business model to build from scratch. It's, uh, it's now working, I would say. <laughs> And um, it's here to stick. <laughs> it, it, that's great. I mean, it, it, it certainly opened up, you know, new audiences for the arts. So I want to ask a couple of questions about funding now, and we're getting a few questions about funding through on the on the app. Um, during the pandemic, what role did philanthropy pa play in getting arts organisations through? Did you see? Did it increase over that time? And um, and. Jane, I know you're particularly interested in how boards should be encouraging philanthropy on, on arts organisations. Can you talk a bit about that? Like mm. what you've seen during the pandemic in terms of sure. philanthropy and what steps boards should be taking to engage mm. um, their donors? Yeah. Um, I, I would go so far as to say that I think it's been one of the positives to come out of the pandemic is the raised awareness in the community of the value of arts. And I think we, we really saw that firsthand. Um, it initially started with um, the amount of um, ticket buyers prepared to donate their tickets. And in the first year, in 2020, that was for, for both Opera, and Opera Australia and the Melbourne Theatre Company, that was running at about 25%. So 25% of all ticket buyers were prepared to donate, um, which you know, we, we thought was absolutely fabulous. Um, that, of course, dropped off in 21 when people realised that, you know, actually they might actually want to credit their tickets and see something at some point. But So it dropped to sort of below 20, but nevertheless still, I think, very healthy. And, uh, and you know, I, all arts organisations ran major campaigns and I think there was a real spirit of generosity in the community. And sometimes it's not actually just about the money, it's also about the messaging that goes back into the companies. And I know all of our staff were just, just so absolutely thrilled and, and really humbled that people cared about what was going on. And, and I really think that that came out in the community. I think eventually government responded to that. Um, and I think that's something I would love to see as a, as a, permanent, a permanent trend. But, um, you, know, for, you know, as you would appreciate, philanthropy is terribly important to the arts. Um, sometimes I think government says, well, if, you know, philanthropy will fund that, so we don't need to. So, you know, there's always that dilemma. But it is nevertheless very important, and people really do want to support, whether it's education programs or touring or um, main stage or, or all sorts of things. There is a real, a real interest, and, and we absolutely rely on that, every, every arts company does. As far as boards, um, I would say that there's sort of three things that boards need to really think about. And, and the first one is to actually recognise the importance of philanthropy as, at a cultural level within an organisation. And, and that really is an issue around um, staffing and, and recognising that the cost of a good development team is something that you need to invest in. And as much as most boards might talk about that, I still think generally development is considered somewhat of an overhead. And, uh, and yet, it, it, you know, you, you've, in philanthropy, you have to spend money to make money, to get money. There, there's no other way of doing it and be, beyond a short, a short campaign. But so I think it's resourcing is terribly important and boards have to be prepared to do that and commit those sort of funds. And the second thing that's very important is being prepared to train the staff well it's a very, very small pool of very good fundraisers out there. 
and uh, and and the the industry in general needs a lot of funding and a lot of uh, upskilling. And then the third point is that boards need to engage, and boards need to realise that they have to lead by example, and they have to have those hard conversations. And not everybody's very is comfortable with that, but one way or another, I think boards need to actually get involved as well. And I think if those three things happen we will see a more sustained approach to philanthropy in the arts. The other big contributor, of course, in terms of funding to the arts is the government. And mm -hmm. I think there was probably a perception during the pandemic that the federal government at least was a bit late to the party in supporting the arts. Um, we have a question. I mean, eventually they, they, they did come through with, um, uh, with the sustainability fund, which I think from the perspective of a director was really important in terms of those solvency questions that many arts organisations were facing in terms yeah. of plummeting, plummeting ticket revenue, just giving directors that confidence to be able to keep trading. We have a more direct question than, than that though from the app, is it just from Jennifer Wilson, who's just asking, isn't it time the contribution made by the creative industries was better recognised by government. I suspect the answer to that is yes, but do you want to talk about um, government funding and what you would like to see there, Sophie? <laughs> well, um, I must say, first of all, that I'm, we are very grateful uh, that the government came to our rescue because we are an organisation that w received one of the first sustainability grants. So we had to be audited, assessed... <laughs> And um, unfortunately, the assessment came out that we were at risk and that we had managed our meager reserves and everything we had as well as could be. Um, and we, uh, on the, and I agree totally on philanthropy is so important. Um, at some point, our musician, our staff, board, everyone uh, started making phone calls to patrons, subscribers, donor. No donation was too small, and that probably helped us survive, plus a sustainability grant. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's concerning that we get to a point where <laughs> we need to be saved. Anyway, um, so... I think we are extremely grateful um, and we have received two sustainability grants and we will not have been... Um, we, we launched part one of our season in 21 because we were unable to put part two on sales. We were not sure we would have the... We, we would be solvent or not. So <laughs> it's been really difficult moments. I hope I never see that again. <laughs> And, uh, but we're really happy to be here and turn the page and move forward and do great music. And yeah, I, I think you certainly weren't alone in taking those sustainability grants. I think every major arts organisation dipped and into the sustainability fund. Maybe one of the things that we learn is to advocate more and more and more and to advocate together. So the, uh, the major performing arts organisation in Melbourne, around the country, so we really rallied and try to talk with uh, one voice, and we will keep doing that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I think advocacy is, is vitally important, um, and sometimes it's a little bit competitive in the arts, which is a shame, and I think it would be good to see everybody um, united in, in their approach to government, which is ongoing. Um, I would say the government is, during the pandemic was a little bit slow, but eventually came through particularly the federal government and the New South Wales state government. Um, and I think they're great, and as the Australia Council, um, we're all part of the same National Performing Arts Group, so we do get funding. There's a whole lot of an, uh, this whole arts ecology out there that doesn't do as well as any of us do. But um, the Australia Council, who manages all of that, paid our, uh, paid our funds ahead of time, which would prevent insolvency in a lot of cases by the end of 2020. So I think they were doing absolutely as much as they possibly could and advocating into government as well. I think the only part that was disappointing and we all did try very hard to make happen was um, not including the casualised arts workforce in JobKeeper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, in theatre, for example, you know, we have a, a reasonably small staff and you hire everybody, every creative for every show. So they couldn't show that they had an annualised income. So they didn't, they didn't 
qualify for JobKeeper. And um, yeah, there was a lot of private funding to help those, art, those particular artists. But I really do think that that was bitterly unfair because they, that they are the heart and soul of our industry, but they are contracted. So they're not a permanent staff. So they, they, they missed out, I'm sure you all know. But I think that was the worst part of it. I just pick up on a point Jane said because I think with the ballet, what's really interesting with, with um, the ballet is we actually didn't find ourselves in the same position as everybody else because we have had such a strong philanthropy mm -hmm. team for so many years yeah. and we've had the most amazing benefactors over a long time and the, the company built up a lot of reserves to be able to sustain us through these times. Mm -hmm. We did get JobKeeper, we still got our base funding, um, but we also had an amazing, incredible amount of donations and support last year, both from things like our audiences and subscribers crediting and giving us, um, donating the tickets, but also more importantly from you know, our, our regular donors who really stepped up last year and the last two years. And I think that investing in that team, we, you know, I would say at the ballet, we probably have one of the masters of um, philanthropy, Kenneth Watkins, who mm. does an incredible job, yeah. and you know, it, it, and he set helps set the ballet up for to be able to 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 come, go through those times and still be standing there. And we, um, you know, we we don't need the sustainability fund. We're very fortunate like that. Um, so it's really interesting that investment years ago has really paid off. I think. Mm. Thank you for all the great questions that are coming through. We won't be able to ask all of them, but I just wanted to pick up partly on that JobKeeper point you were making, Jane, and ask about employee well-being during this time and staff, staff well-being. We have a question uh, on the app about how you made sure that your artists stayed fit, performance fit, mm -hmm. during, the, mm. during the pandemic mm. and were able to continue practising their craft. But we should ask that question, but also maybe just the broader question about how... I mean, if we know it was just a really, really difficult time for artists not being able to perform, not being able to do their living, um, their, their passion. How did you as a board in, engage with your staff and make sure that they were okay during that period? Do you want me to go you, first? You, go, you can go. <laughs> anyone um, well, can go. I think the interesting thing with the ballet, I mean, we have elite performers, you know, art dancers are elite performers, and in the first lockdown here in Melbourne, they had to do that from their kitchen and their living room. And it was a very stressful time for everybody. And I think the board, you know, the man management were overseeing and they were doing dance classes online, really trying to engage, really trying to look after people. People were very st highly stressed. Then uh, during the second lockdown, we managed to be able to get um, a permits for them to go and perform. Um, to, to be Because it was dangerous to be able to tring over your cat, you know, as you're performing, trying to perform in the, ki in the kitchen. And also trying to keep that... Um, level performance and athleticism um, so that you could actually come back and perform at that level um, two years later. And so it was really, as a board, I think, you know, the well-being and health of your people and well-being of, of Australians in general is going to be the biggest issue we're going to face mm. going forward. And I think you have a duty of care as a board, as, a board, yeah. as, a, as an organisation, to look after and do as much as you can um, to help your teams and your staff. And whether that's, you know, giving them um, uh, tools to help um, whether it's communicating with them, um, anything you can do as an organisation to help them uh, go through this and have their wellbeing in, in place, um, I think is something all organisations and all boards should be focused on. Sophie, you have a slightly different perspective being part of the management team. At the MSO, how did you, how did you go about you know, uh, maintaining staff morale, making mm -hmm. sure that the mental health of, of your staff was, was OK, at least during the, during the pandemic? Well, first aid, mental health, first aid training, uh, lots of activities. Um, I devoted a lot of my time to advocate to government with my colleagues from the MTC, the ballet, to have our musicians become authorised workers so that in a very covid safe environment, be able to restart working together because an orchestra is a lot of amazing talent, but you need to put them together to get the sound. <laughs> they can't, again, do that from the kitchen uh, on Zoom. <laughs> doesn't work that well. So eventually we got there through a lot of advocacy and that really helped uh, lift the morale and then mentally prepare to go back on stage in front of an audience. It's not the same practicing in a room together as the next step. So it's been a big focus of us and it will remain a big focus for us. We're nearly at time for drinks oh. now. We only have a couple of minutes <laughs> left. What I might do now is just get you all to put your big picture thinking hat on. The Thank conference you. itself is about 
uh, growth, recovery, what's next after the pandemic. And as we talked about earlier, you all express a lot of optimism for, for where we are now. The big picture question is, what is the next phase for the art sector? How does it continue to grow and flourish? What does it look like after the, after the pandemic? Does, does anyone want to go first? I can, I can throw to you maybe, Jane. Sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, we're all hoping that the recovery continues is the first thing. Mm -hmm. So we're all hoping we get through 2022 and, um, and actually can try to replace some of our reserves or replenish some of our finances, I would say, in the, in the short, short term. Um, I think... Um, but I, I think what I was saying before about the fact that arts are now so much more on everybody's radar, and I think this is a very important time to sort of promote the role we play in enriching the everyday. Um, it's, and I think we need to capitalise on that awareness and that value recognition. So advocacy across all art forms, I think, is, is vital. Um, that we, that we need to try and keep doing that, as we discussed before. And, um, and I think there should be more opportunities for collaboration and support across the whole sector and awareness of the health and the ecology across the sector. Um, and developing talent on and off stage. One of, the, one of the implications of the pandemic is a lot of people have left the industry. So there's a real shortage of skilled and unskilled talent in the technical areas. Everything from wig, wig making to costume design to mm. dressmaking and, and you know, those sorts of things are vitally important to something like opera. Um, so uh, I, I think there'd be a real awareness even at our, all of our, each of our companies, how important that is. And I think it also plays into our diversity requirements where we're all under um, an obligation to create diversity and inclusion across the art forms. And I think one of the areas we should think about is doing that in the back of house as well as doing it on stage. So, you know, there, I think there are lots of really great opportunities and... Um, and assuming we can, assuming we can survive on stage this year, a chance to fund some of those opportunities. So I, you know, I, I feel kind of encouraged. Um, the MTC, we've got a new artistic director, so she's a new, young, vibrant woman who's very interested in building new audiences and telling new stories. Um, with Opera Australia, we've got a new CEO, a new chair, and have just gone out last week for a new artistic director. So again, um, an organisation in a state of change where, again, looking for different audiences, everybody realises now how important that is and how that needs to be a major focus. How that plays out in terms of revenues is, is always the dilemma. Um, you know, the commercial imperative versus the artistic vision, always a struggle. But uh, assuming we can all get that right, I think there's a real chance to see some really exciting things coming up across our various art forms, and, um, and I hope we can make that happen. I, I can attest that Anne-Louise Sachs, the new artistic director of the Melbourne Theatre Company, is a fantastic artistic director. She's one of, I've seen a few of her productions. She's one of Sydney's best, and the Melbourne mm. Theatre Company has stolen her. <laughs> Sophie, do you want to talk about your vision for the arts this year? Yes, a couple of wishes. I think that... Uh, we have to continue on a journey as as a, a group on the diversity, equity, um, inclusivity, First Nation, big focus for the next few years. Sustainability, very important. And what does that mean for arts organization? And my, my big wish is for Australia to come together with government and uh, the philanthropic sector to, to actually create reserve for small, medium, and large organization. We see that in other countries around the world, in the UK, in the United States, and Canada. After major shifts, SARS in North America, where um, government partnered with, uh, with, with Canadians, for example, and um, helped um, all arts organizations uh, get bigger reserves so that we are better equipped next time a crisis comes around. And um, yes, I think that that's my big wish for the next few years. And Penny, round us out with something well, inspiring. I'll, no, no, I'm not sure it's inspiring, <laughs> but I agree with what both um, 
Jane and Sophie said, but I think the big picture thinking is how do we take these lessons um, of being locked in our houses um, for two years pretty much and transform the arts and our delivery of the arts and engage new audiences going forward, younger audiences, new audiences, make us more accessible to, you know, all Australians. I think they're the real, they're, they're some really big opportunities that can come out of this time um, if we approach things and look at, look at those lessons learned and think, OK, how big can we be and how can we change how we deliver some of these art forms? I think that's inspiring. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> so th this has been a fascinating, wide-ranging and very honest um, discussion. So thank you, Jane. Thank you, Sophie. And thank you, Penny, for that. Let's look, give them all a round of, round of applause. Right. Um, so we've reached the end of the day. I don't think a nuclear war has started in Russia, Ukraine at the moment, so we can all go down and enjoy our drinks. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you, we'll see you downstairs and we'll see you again tomorrow for another, for another great day at the AGS.